The International Space Station is the largest modular human space outpost to ever exist. It represents billions of dollars of investments and serves as an advanced scientific research base for all of humanity. It has been in service for the last 20 plus years, and so far while the station has not suffered any extreme emergencies, the exponential rise in space debris threatens to endanger all of future low Earth orbit operations and spaceflight as a whole. This is SpaceCat Engineering, and in this video we will cover the background and effects of orbital space debris and the effects it could have for future space explorations off planet Earth. Orbital debris has rapidly increased over the last 60 years. Defunct, old, and decommissioned satellites often linger for years in orbit around the planet. In this series of animations, you can actually get a scale of just how polluted it is up there. With current technology, we can track items anywhere from a few feet in diameter to a few inches. Without power or functionality, this junk floats aimlessly in space until either it deorbits and evaporates in Earth's atmosphere, or it could collide with other satellites. This is obviously a worst case situation that is often feared by scientists. This actually has happened a handful of times. In one example back in 2009, two satellites collided to create massive clouds of microdebris that polluted the orbits of other satellites for months afterwards. This problem has also been exacerbated by the increasing rate of commercial, military, and private space launches. While it's a topic for another video, NASA tracks orbiting space debris with the Space Surveillance Network, otherwise known as the SSN. The 18th Space Defense Squadron of the U.S. Space Force maintains and operates the SSN to track and report the clouds of space debris with resolution capabilities of seeing items as small as 2 inches. Their massive database keeps logs and tracks the ever-increasing list of space debris to protect orbit operations. If there is a hazard, conjunction assessments and collision avoidance maneuvers are effective in countering debris four inches or larger. NASA actually reports that their shielding on spacecraft typically protects from debris up to a quarter inch in size. So if you're following along at home, you can see that there may be some red flags here. If NASA can protect from space debris a quarter inch or smaller, that protects them from items mostly like paint chips and small objects. And if NASA can see items larger than two inches, that obviously protects them from most of the major debris. The biggest issue comes from items that cannot be tracked but are dangerous enough to damage vehicles and astronauts. Isn't it comforting to know that there are millions of these items floating around in space and we don't even know where they are? According to one NASA report from 2021, there are actually millions of pieces of orbital debris floating in low Earth orbit, ranging from the size of a softball all the way down to a size of a marble or so. Even something as small as a grain of salt could actually rupture protective linings on sensitive components or extravehicular suits. This has actually occurred recently when a Soyuz is believed to have suffered a rupture in a pressurized coolant line. This is a really fascinating case and it's actually currently under investigation still. You know, you could think, well, what's the risk of a grain of salt? How much damage could it really do? But don't forget that everything in low Earth orbit is technically in a continuous freefall state. That is to say, while it may feel like zero-g to humans, all the items in low Earth orbit are actually zipping around as fast as 15,000 miles per hour. At this speed, they can do some serious damage to materials. This graph actually shows the breakdown of different types of debris broken into different groups. This includes rocket bodies, mission-related debris, spacecraft, and fragmentation debris. This graph actually highlights one of the important factors in space debris. You can actually see a massive spike from 2006 to 2008. This is actually a direct result of an anti-satellite missile test. And this is my moment to say stop shooting down satellites with missiles. I'm looking at you four. As we see space programs continue to prosper, we'll see more and more space junk accumulating up in the skies if we don't do anything. Across its lifetime so far, the ISS has served as a beacon for scientific advancement in a zero-g environment. The ISS has supported over 20 years of continuous human presence on station and has promoted research advancements in various disciplines such as medicine, robotics, physics, material science, and engineering. ISS research spans across almost every branch of scientific and engineering foundations. So many valuable discoveries have been made thanks to ISS. So many, in fact, that NASA actually has a published book written all about its various contributions. I've actually included the link in the description for anyone who wants to check it out after this. All of this scientific research is in constant jeopardy due to the dangers from space debris. One very visible representation of this danger can be seen on the ISS's cupola. This is a unique windowed dome attached to Node 3 that offers some of the best views outside of the station 
and where some of the most iconic space to ground photos have been captured. If you notice, however, each window actually has a shutter attached. These are used to protect the window during high orbit debris events. The insulated pads offer much more protection than the fragile window elements from miniature micrometeoroid impacts that could actually fracture the glass and jeopardize the pressurization of the station. Dustin from Smarter Every Day actually has a really excellent video on this topic, so please go check that out when you get a chance. Due to the effects of atmospheric drag, the ISS actually loses elevation over time and has to periodically perform maintenance reboost to maintain its orbit. These are nominal and expected events that don't drastically affect station life, but sometimes station has to perform emergency avoidance boosts to maneuver away from potential space debris dangers. The International Space Station has actually performed over 27 debris avoidance maneuvers since 1999. These boosting events are slower than you'd expect. These clips actually show the footage of station basically moving around the floating astronauts. For the ISS, avoiding space debris is mainly about luck, timing, and training. Due to the erratic nature of space debris, accurately tracking the debris is a rough science. For example, a debris field that could impact the station in 48 hours could eventually swerve enough to just miss it completely. On the flip side, this can create situations in which crew members are only given a short window of warning for a pending space debris collision. Flight controllers at Johnson Space Center are tracking these hazards 24-7 and rely on the reports from the SSN to accurately predict the occurrences. Flight controllers utilize a boundary system for classifying possible collision situations. This boundary layer is approximately 2.5 miles deep by 30 miles across by 30 miles long with the space station sitting in the center. To determine the level of hazard posed to the space station, NASA flight controllers have developed NASA flight rules that determine collision probabilities and assigns them into one of four different flight risk levels. These are broken up into different thresholds. Beginning with the green threshold, this represents nominal operating conditions. Space debris items are tracked and monitored, but they do not pose an imminent threat to the station in any capacity. Then we have the yellow threshold, this represents a 1 in 10,000 to a 1 in 100,000 collision chance. This situation is weighted on the risk versus rewards of the situation. For example, flight controllers would have to determine the balance of delaying, you could say, crew operations like resupply missions or an EVA outside the station versus boosting the station to a safer orbit. Representing imminent danger, we then have the red threshold. This represents a 1 to a 1 in 10,000 collision chance. During a red threshold event, all ISS complex operations and planned events are frozen, and actions are immediately taken to boost the station to a safer orbit. And lastly, we have the black threshold. In the event all else fails and the space station is unable to plan and perform a burn in time, crew members must follow specific emergency management protocols. With late notice of a red threshold, historically crews have prepared emergency evacuation procedures and have bunkered down in their respective crew vehicles ready to depart the station in the event of any disaster. This represents the most dire and devastating situations, and it's only occurred a handful of times in the station's history. Clever engineers are pursuing different avenues to protect and minimize from space debris damage, so there certainly is a hope to overcome the hazards. Like I previously mentioned, the majority of space monitoring comes from the Space Surveillance Network. Their new and improved Space Surveillance Telescope offers breakthroughs in telescope design, camera technology, and image analyzing software that enables for much faster discovery and tracking of previously unseen and hard to find small objects. To complement this ground support, the space station has actually deployed a new monitoring device called the Space Debris Sensor. This sensor will provide insight into the microparticles that cannot be tracked on Earth. It'll monitor the small debris environment around the space station for two to three years. It has the resolution to record debris between the sizes of 0.5 millimeters up to 0.5 millimeters. The space debris sensor utilizes a three-layered acoustic system that characterizes the size, speed, direction, and density of the different small particles that impact the station. This dual film system provides the time, location, and speed of the debris, while the final layer, the lexicon backstop, provides the density of the object. Data gathered during the SDS investigation will help researchers map the entire orbital debris population and plan future sensors beyond the space station and in low Earth orbit. In this last section of the video, we'll talk about the various different solutions that could help in the removal of space debris. Right now, the easiest engineering solution has to be install compatible shielding that will protect critical components on station. 
In this video clip, we can see astronaut crews practicing in the NBL pool for removing and modifying a Whipple shield that is located on the space station. Most commonly, Whipple shields are used as the primary defense throughout different locations on the station. This photo actually represents the shielding varieties located on the station, each color representing a different shield type. There are actually over 400 different shields protecting critical space station items. At the most basic level, these shields utilize a sacrificial layer that diverts and diffuses the majority of the impact energy before damaging the critical infrastructure below. Often these layers are interlaid with extra protective materials like Nextel, Kevlar, and Honeycomb to reinforce their strength properties. There are a lot of really futuristic ideas out there that could offer some great solutions. For example, one idea involves a high-powered laser system that could utilize the heat from a laser blast to vaporize a minuscule segment of a piece of space junk. The resulting plasma ejection could slow down the object enough to bring it down into Earth's orbit. Another really interesting futuristic idea is Clear Space One. This ESA-funded mission will be launched into low Earth orbit where it will be maneuvered to track down its target satellite, grabbing it using its quartet of robotic arms, and dragging it into a declining orbit. These are just two examples of possible solutions, but as a whole it's important to remember that this video shows that space junk is a pretty terrible situation overall, but there certainly are brilliant engineers working on innovative and unique solutions that will continue to allow humans to maintain their operations in space for the long term future. If you like this kind of content, please do consider subscribing as it really does help the channel. I've included a playlist of some of my other videos, so please give them a watch at the end. If you have any other questions or comments, be sure to let me know in the comments.